Hello fish tubers out there. Welcome to Fish Easy live stream number six. We're going to have an interesting day today answering some questions that have come up over the week. Also we're going to take a look at some of the masses of fish that you have seen in these tanks. I'm looking forward to reviewing with you various things. Thank you so much S for joining us. It's uh, your regular here, I've noticed that. Thank you very much. Also, Canadian Aquatics is here, thank you, hello. Good to see you too. And we have uh, several in the house. So we're going to uh, take a look at all these fish that I have, and we're going to be looking and examining how the management is done so that the fish, thousands of them, can be processed in this small fish room. Take a look at uh, just some of these tanks that we're talking about. Here is um, uh, a few of the smaller tanks. Hello Stubbs Aquatics. Thank you very much. You're always so reliable, loyal. Good to see you. And uh, here we have the rams growing up on the workbench. And as you can see, they're getting to be quite a few. So we're going to be looking at that today. We're also going to be taking a uh, a moment to just reflect on some of the questions that have come up um, during the week. As you can see, there's been a change, and this big tank now has quite a few in, quite a few um, rams in it, 450 to be exact. They're doing very well. We'll see if uh, they would like to come up and say hello. Hello, you there? Anybody? They just arrived in their new tank yesterday. Last night, in fact, and in fact, that's where they, they came from. Take a look at this tank here. This is the tank that uh, they were in, and there's nothing in there. So it's now been cleared out. In fact, it's dark. Can't even hardly see, and it just, just the heater going. I have a few uh, huh, plecos in there. I can't even find them. But uh, right next to it is a smaller tank, and as you can see, we've got more German blue rams than we know what to do with. Hi Nonstop Aquatics, welcome and we appreciate everybody coming back. Thank you so much for all the support just to be able to drop in and say hello, ask questions and get some answers. In this fish room we're going to also um, make mention of um, box filters. We're going to take a look at some of the uh, actual fish that we have been looking at uh, uh, from last week. So let's get started. Let's get started right into it. Welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for all your comments. It's good to see everyone. Thank you so much. Our first visit will be the box. Remember last week we actually took these fish out of, uh, they were eggs at the time, out of a rock in the tank and we put them into a breeder box. Let's take a look at what they're looking at right now looking like. This is what they're looking like. It's a box filter. Now they've hatched. They've just been over the week sitting along the bottom. And all these fish, these are German blue rams, are kind of piled up many times along the corner and often where I have a small air stone going. These fish are not eating. They are not being fed. Um, the water was changed. Uh, just to remove the methylene blue that was put in at the beginning. We saw that last week. But as you can see today, for the first time, some of them are starting to climb up the walls. Some of them are starting to go up. Hi, Jonathan Walker, welcome. Good to see you in the house, in the fish room. And at the top, you might see one or two, there's in the back corner there, a couple of German blues. They're hanging out at the top. So right now, they're all still at the bottom with just a couple or a few coming up. Now this is the stage in which I would normally go ahead and put in some... Um, I think I would just start to put in some paramecia, give them some infusoria. To get it in the water, mostly I'm going to do that now. Let's see if I can tilt the camera without dropping it. Okay. So 
what I want to do is just make sure I can get some of the water uh, with a little bit of live protozoa or in this case infusoria going. So I take my um, culture and I squeeze some in there and I'm not going to pull it as much as I can. I'm not going to fill it up. They're not really eating yet, but I want just a few drops. I'm going to just put I just put some, this is the first time I'm putting it in. I'm just putting some drops in there. Looks like uh, maybe, maybe a quarter of a baster full. And that's it. A quarter of a baster full, nothing more. The purpose, in my opinion, is to get it to the point where when they start looking for something to eat, even with a egg yolk, I mean, once they start swimming, and they're starting to swim, if they see something that goes past them, kind of wiggly, kind of moving about, and remember their eyes can see the microscopic, uh, this looks kind of big to them, this big paramecia swimming by, they're small, and then what I'm looking for is getting them to already get triggered for that food, start looking for it as food. So it won't die, I just put enough in there, that paramecia will not die and it won't foul the water other than the amount of water I put in there. So I have to be cautious about that. That's why I don't overdo it. But from a concentrated um, amount at, the, at there, what I, I'm doing actually is I'm actually putting it in such a way that the paramecia will be in the water, the water won't be foul, and then they're going to start growing in to the point where they're going to start eating and I will already have some be picking at it. So that's the, that's the purpose or thought. And I don't know if there's any scientific proof that it's better to do it that way. It's just experience. I have found that I've done it many times like that and it just seems to work very well. So that's another little side. You get a little uh, side uh, um, tip today. Now in this case, uh, there's not much more going on until they're really swarming, until they're all off the bottom. When they're just kind of laying on the bottom, wiggling, they're not really doing much. It's the ones that are starting to go that I'm focusing on right now. In the end, when they all get off the bottom and they all kind of rise up, that's when I will start with more amounts, larger quantities of the paramecia food. At the same time, changing half the water. So we demonstrated that in a previous session. If you go back to the previous live stream, you'll see that. What I'll do is I'll drain it to one half, and then I use my simple um, gravity feeder to re replace the water, and I use a, a timer of four minutes, and it's exactly right. So four minutes, I can replace half the water. So that is a nice, quick view of the progress from this particular batch. Maybe in the future we'll keep watching this batch, uh, 1365, I hope everything works out right, but uh, I'll keep every week show you and we'll see the progress of this particular batch and see how it's going. Now, also um, um, the question has come up about what do you do when they kind of grow into this box? Let's go look at that. I'm going to try uh, turning the camera around. Before I do that, any questions that will come up, I want to make sure. Hello, everybody. Looks like everybody's uh, uh, content. I'm going to try to turn the camera around. I want to see what will happen. And does that work? Um, hmm. That's kind of that's kind of crazy. Why is it doing that? What's wrong with my camera? Okay, well that that well maybe I'm maybe I pinched it. Maybe I'm too, no, that's not going to work. Oh, wait a minute here. Okay, yep. Yeah, somehow, somehow they got. Okay, that's better. Let me see if this works. Oh, it did it again. There's something. There's something that's caused by my stand. Okay, well. I won't uh, do that. Okay, it was a try. We were attempting to do something that might have improved the uh, the view, so I could see uh, what was going on on the screen, so I don't have any problems. Now, 
back to what we were discussing. As the fry get bigger, we're going to um, see that in the breeder boxes we have on the wall, notice the ones down below. Look how full they are. Okay? These ones are ready to be moved. Okay? They've got to be moved out of here. You might even see one that didn't make it. They're starting to, a few die. Um, if I see some deaths in there, it's time to start thinking about it. And that's where I want to do something. So today, after this live stream, they're going to be moved. But where do they get moved to? Well, looking in the fish room, typically what I do is I move them into this five gallon on the workbench. And that's where they'll go next. So even those two boxes might even be combined. But today I might even do something even more desperate because you see these over here need to be moved. They're, out, they're outlived their 10 gallon size. These, I prefer the medium size breeder box and the large size. I don't have any smalls, those are way too small. There's three sizes, small, medium, and large. The small is like smaller than a, than a cup. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, I don't even know what it's good for. So I use the mediums because I can get three of them across, but I can also use one large. And you see that space in between the two mediums down on the bottom? I can fit one large in there. So the answer to that question is, I would prefer all large if I could, and I can't because they don't fit. Now on a 20 gallon long, I'll just look over at the catfish real quick, and you see on the 20 gallon long, you can fit two large boxes and then you have one room for one medium in the middle, but you can't fit three large. So the size constraints kind of tell me which size to use. So, with that in mind, I try to make use of the entire length of the tanks in order to maximize my load, maximize my boxes. But you know what? What goes into the large boxes is usually when I get a super large batch. And some of the batches aren't as large as others. So on the upper, you see there's a lot of bright light over there. Let me see this go look a little closer. How big these batches are. Okay. You see this one? And uh, these are doing well. In the corner, you see a, a batch. They're doing great. These are, um, these are, remember these are the two batches that are only five days apart? Yeah, these are only five days apart. These are five days older, and they're quite a bit larger. But the other ones will definitely catch up because the two batches are they're from the same male different females and this is uh, they can be combined I don't have a problem with that especially since I know they're out of the same male the same tank and so they're both labeled C the letter C so I know which exactly which male that is now they'll probably be combined when they get big enough and they're ready to jump out of their medium sized boxes uh, I'll probably combine them at that time, but these two will be combined I'll probably put them in the 10 gallon and then move these 10 gallons So it's it's a big process of moving fish constantly the fish are accustomed to the water That I have in the whole fish room. So as long as the temperature is good What I do is I take these um, these different Tanks and after doing you know, I know that after doing a check on the temperature, if the temperature check is within one degree, I will just simply scoop them out and put them in another tank. When I do, however, go from one tank to the next, hello Roman, welcome, glad you could join us, uh, uh, it's good to see you online. When I do take the uh, fish out, I actually put them in a uh, small two and a half gallon and put them in a, a tank with a gallon of water, uh, two gallons of water in this perhaps, maybe half filled, half filled. Put this half filled, stick the fish in there, and then very carefully go through them and see if there's any that need to be culled out. So unfortunately, you always find one missing a gill plate. Maybe it's there's something wrong with it. Um, um, I haven't had to, I haven't seen many of those in my line of fish. I but there's once in a while, there's maybe a runt. Look at look at in the bottom. It's impossible to go fish them out with a net because they all herd together and it looks crazy. But look at that tiny, tiny, tiny one at the bottom. Uh, those those are the ones that I typically look for and say, you know, you didn't make it this big at this stage of this game. 
at this point and I'm moving them on and it's time to to just uh, um, kind of put you know hold them back and so they don't make it they don't go on to the next tank so now this is uh, what's nice I have a 10 gallon spare up here I used to have some crayfish last week uh, this last week of the year last year I was able to to wipe out um, uh, several groups of fish to make room in my tanks uh, you know I used to have a shark tank here and we enjoyed seeing the uh, roseline sharks and so forth but unfortunately I needed the tank space and I needed to grow these up I took out uh, 100 from this group uh, and sold them last Mon Monday yeah last Monday I took a hundred and to the store and sold them wholesale to the store and they uh, uh, were glad to have them because it was time to to get some some really good um, uh, fish to replace what they had so as you can see I play um, musical chairs or shall we term it musical tanks whenever um, I have these fish growing up so I wanted to mention all this because how do you handle so many fish I'd like to to read to you the comment that we got after last week's session uh, this is from hatchery uh, from Matthew Clayton thank you Matthew Clayton for your comment uh, you were curious no no that's not it either you know who it was my, I got the wrong list here from that particular question. That particular question uh, came in an email. That was from, um, uh, was that you, Chris? Was that not Chris? Stubbs, Stubbs Aquatics? I think it was Stubbs Aquatics. I think it was your question. The question was, what... I see so many fish. I see tanks full of fish. You know, how do you handle that? So basically moving them from tank to tank to tank is how I have to handle it. Unfortunately, it's not the preferred method. If I had a space where maybe 55 gallon tanks were lined up, I could put several 55 gallon tanks. Okay, 40s. Maybe 40s would be good. Um, your comments would be appreciated what you think would be adequate but if I had 40 gallon tanks 55 gallon tanks running that could actually take these fish at the stage where yeah they coming out of here maybe a little bit larger so at the point where you saw in the 40 gallon or this 90 gallon they're about almost ready to sell what I would do is I would put them in a 55 and I would grow them out and I would spread them out over the tanks Give them a lot of space they will grow much faster that way and get more colorful and then when you bring them into the shops everybody's eyes pop and they're just like what those are nice fish you know nothing like the ones that get imported and and go through that process and mass produced of course i'm not saying they're not mass produced here but i'm just look just to give you an idea of my production this is 2021 i started in may and um, I produced from actually sold rams. This is the number of rams I sold in 2021. And these are only the ones, not, the, not all, but these are the ones that got to the point. I mean, there were many more, of course, but as got to the point where I could actually sell them. And it was 812. So n not quite a thousand. But as you can see here at this moment, I have with four or five hundred there, I have close to 2,000 fry right now. And I've been building up because over the course of months, you know, these go back several months old, you know, they're three, four months old by the time they, they go to market. And those are just maturing and they're just starting to lay and they're going into uh, their, their initial colors. However, they're not at full size. They're not at full size. And so they're not full size mature. Now I have, I have a, an opinion that it's better to buy something that you see that's not quite full size. When you go to the pet shop, you see something that's like in the tank and you want to say, oh, you know, I'm interested in that particular fish. 
look at it and say to yourself, is it still growing? Is it young? Or is it old? Is it a fish that has seen its day, is, is at the end or close of its lifetime? The answer to that question is basically, no, um, it's hard to tell when they're full size. So I like to get fish that I can see are almost full size. They're not quite. You can tell that they're young. They're maybe slightly mature, and I'd rather get them and then mature them, let them become mature, and then use those for breeding when they start their, their cycle. And maybe the first batch um, isn't going to be the best. It's not going to be the, the first ram batch is usually very small, and the males have a hard time figuring out what they're supposed to do. So uh, they usually sometimes is like only 20% fertile. But by the second and third batch, these fish have figured it out. They've got the practice in and they're doing it. So they're going to be at their peak of their, their productivity years uh, when they're young. So if I were to sell my, my rams full size, most people wouldn't be sure if how old they are and are these two-year-old fish with you know if they only have a three to five year lifespan you know i'm not a, you know they're not going to last forever in my tank and and the bottom line is if they're young you, you know you're starting off at the beginning and you have much more time on your hands so yeah roman uh i think i think roman uh you picked up uh a pair of uh or did, did Oh no, maybe it was Gary. Gary at the at the club. He picked up some uh, of the younger ones, and I'm curious to see. He's been very pleased with them. He says they're looking great, but I'm wondering how they're doing. Please send me a, a photo. I always appreciate hearing back when I can. So, let's get back to the point. You get all these fish. What do you do with them all? And as they get to a point in this fish room, they get large enough to sell. I do not have another tank to move them to. That means I have to push a little bit to sell them. Even if I have to drop the price, that's fine. You know, I have to move them because I have more coming. So in this production line, they're going to fall off the end of the production line onto the floor if, if, if I don't have something to catch them, right? The cookies are coming off, you know, how they're just coming off the... The, the conveyor belt and they get to the end and that's it you know and they got to be put into the basket and carried away so um, when somebody comes and wants to buy some you know it's great for me I think great you know I'll take if I want to take them into the store I will uh, it means you have to hustle and basically hustling is what it's all about you know you have to contact your your store and say well, how are you looking with your your rams you have to know um, do they need some? Um, whatever fish you're actually involved with, it's the same story. Uh, you, you're going to need to find a, a place for them. Uh, I use Kijiji here in Canada. It's the same concept as Craigslist in the United States. Uh, I used to use Craigslist when I was in California. And it's the same uh, principle. So use use the, the means to get the word out and uh, when I post it for people to pick up, I don't care for lots of people to come by. And it's all this curbside pickup is basically all we have at the moment going on. But I will charge more to the person who picks one up. Still cheap compared to what they will find retail at the store. But it helps. It helps with the, um, the total price. My, uh, my entire fish room, including the rams, including everything, in 2021 was pushing, uh, not quite, not, not, not there yet, but almost $5,000 of sales. So I'm very happy um, with the way it's been going. I had, remember, um, um, I had koi angelfish. I was, I was producing lots of those, and they were a big seller. I, I don't have those anymore. Um, I'm making room. I have the discus now, and I would like to see what I can do with those. In fact, uh, how are those discus doing? Let's just take a quick look. There they are. I moved them this week into their new tank. I put them in this 30-gallon. In the center of the room, it's sort of a display tank. 
and they continue to get bigger and they continue to grow i've got about i don't know five orange ones or marble reds and the rest are looking really sharp nice lines there's only about two of them look a little puny for some reason not growing as fast as their their, their brothers and sisters but these are these are really neat I'm anxious to see how they'll do. Now, what's really nice is that, from what I understand, um, I'm going to be able to... Um, take these these discus, and I'm going to be able to put them with the... the, the, the um, I'm going to put them in with the uh, rams, because I can keep the temperature to 82 degrees and the rams will be fine with that and the you know and the I'm trying to get a close up there we go there's one that's kind of there we go there we go Ugh, keeps moving kind of hard to it's like a it's not exactly shooting fish in a barrel is it it's it's a moving target rather and so yeah they're doing fine they're just zipping around here I, they, they had no problem moving over into this tank by the time i moved them into this tank they were already on uh, regular tap water regular tap water so so they're in tap water now they're just growing in the tap water that's fine um it was only when they were very young when i had uh, lower tds i used ro water just to keep them in uh, low tds when they were hatching and then slowly I was uh, doing more and more tap water until finally they were all back in tap water. So that's that's the story with uh, our our dis discus and how well they're doing. I I'm really really uh, pleased with how they've come out. There's about 25. So now um, just to continue our line of thought before we go on to the next question, um, I would like to mention that when you have a tank, now behind me, for example, this one. Uh, right now, I'm doing a water change on these. I use the trickle method. So, as you can see up here, the tubes come down from a tube that goes from this top tank up there all the way down to here. Then there's valves right here underneath. And I just kind of decide which tanks get a water change. So, you can see here's a... I don't know, can you see the, the, the dripping? This is dripping a little bit. There we go. I can adjust that watch there we go so I can you see there's more water coming through and I'm just going to use this drip method I'm going to let that run for an hour just dripping and the excess water it won't overflow because I've got in the back you see those overflows so we talked about that in past live streams you can see my videos and by the way thank you if you're just want to throw out a, a side point if you're viewing this later after the live stream and, and you're on the replay leave a comment down below just say hey i'm on the replay crew you know appreciate that uh little feedback it, it really helps so then also um um hit the thumbs up you're all here or if you're on the replay crew as well hit the thumbs up it doesn't hurt and uh, that just gives me an idea of how many people are interested in in this kind of fish room um discussions and uh, I noticed some more comments. Let me just check. Um, yes, Roman. Roman got six smaller rams. Okay, and he, yeah, and they they really, they, it's nice to get some younger ones. That's really good. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you, S. Yeah, it's it, it, people who want the older fish. They want the older fish. I I'm not sure why. Um, how do you know that fish isn't you know on its last leg I, I i look at an old fish i look at a medium aged fish and i can't tell the difference i look at a mature fish i still can't see the difference but if i know that they're just slightly smaller you can see the youth for example a bristle nose he's got no he's got all these bristles right and he's coming out with his nose with the bristle if they're just little stubs you know it's a young fish of course, his size is also a little smaller, but you know that fish has got potential and he's going to be around for a few years and he's going to be a good uh, uh, future breeder. 
But if I got one that had these humongous bristles, and I'm thinking to myself, oh yeah, look at that, you know, I'll be a perfect, perfect uh, fish for breeding. You know, I want one with big bristles like that. And then all of a sudden you bring him home, and then, you know, a month later he's like, he dies of old age. And he's probably finished with his cycle of being able to reproduce maybe um, months ago. Well, doesn't make any sense to me. So I'm going to need some participation from one of you. I'm going to do a quick um, water change, and I'm going to tell you why. Here, are, here is the tank in question. As you can see, this tank above has some lines. Uh, we're looking at this one right here. See? There's a top line, and then there's a bottom line. Whoops, sorry. Almost had a uh, drop out there. I need to get a little um, something to set this up. Maybe I can get a little higher. I'm still working out the details of the... Uh, there we go. All right, we'll see if that works. Now, here is where I keep the line. Uh, I like to keep it just like it's almost an inch below the, the, the black rim only because I'm going to, to explain. We're going to actually do a... Um, a timer on it okay we're gonna actually see um, in fact you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna go ahead and demonstrate why it's so important when you have this many fish to change that water several times a day now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my phone and we'll put on the uh, um, timer micrometer where is my uh, timer okay oh, I think it's the same as my alarms okay stopwatch timer okay here we go stopwatch so I have a stopwatch here it took me a minute to get it okay so I'm gonna put uh, the stopwatch here and we're just going to see. Now, I need to do two water changes a day on this this puppy, right? And so, let's, let's um, yeah, you can see the stopwatch. It's small, but we'll see the result. Okay, there's a lot of fish in there. And uh, tonight, I'm going to actually move them over to the big tank right next to them. But uh, let, let's just see on this particular tank what I need to do. And let's see how, how fast it goes. Okay, so start the timer. Boom. And uh, I'm going to now drain the tank. Okay. While I'm draining the tank, I'm going to bring over some, some water. And we're going to get ready for some water induction here. I'm going to put my little refill. When it gets here to the line, I'm going to actually do a 50%, it's almost a 50% change. I turn it off. I turn it off at the line. We're now going to turn on the water. And water begins to spew out using our little pump that we talked about last week. And so, let's see how long it takes. We're, we're now at almost a minute. <laughs> almost a minute. Now, I don't know how long your water changes take, but these are the kinds of water changes that if you're going to do a semi-automatic system, which I use, I call this kind of semi-automatic because an automatic system is there's a timer and there's valves and they come on and off and I could be sleeping. But uh, I like to be able to do my, my water changes by looking and observing, checking the fish, checking out uh, if there's any deaths. That's a very clean tank, actually. One of the reasons is because the siphon in the back of the tank just took out that water and it was a one inch, uh, no, three quarter inch siphon. So those three quarters are really strong. And it just pulls all the sediment on the bottom. It just sucks them all out. And so now I watch the, the, the go up to the top. The fish are enjoying their fresh water. Boy, they are something you think that they never get fed, I'm telling you. So I feed them maybe, um, um, I'm actually, you know, you have to control not feeding, overfeeding them too much. But now the water is there. I go back to my valve and shut it off. When it gets to the line, okay, there it is. 
and I'm going to hit the stop button at 2 minutes and 20 seconds. So we just changed their water. I would do this typically in the morning and the evening about a few minutes after I feed them. So mm -hmm. I'm going to feed them first and then they're going to do their, their um, messy stuff. They're going to, they're going to of course um, foul the water, <laughs> as it were, and they're going to do all that and boom. Cooper Aquatics, welcome. Sorry to hear you've been down. And thanks for coming back and appreciate your visiting us and being with us on live stream today. Thank you, Cooper Aquatics. Well, that's a two minute and, well, let's just call it two and a half minutes. So you got two and a half minutes for that tank. I do two tanks at a time. So while I'm, you saw how I was putting the water and I was draining it, it you know, it's getting the, the next refill stage ready. So what I'm doing is I'm limiting my time with all these tanks. You know, I don't want to have to, to take too long of a time. So I can handle two tanks at once, refilling. You, I can only handle two things at once. I learned this from Greg Sage. And by the way, just so you all know, Greg Sage is still alive and kicking. And he's, he's got a big project he's working on. And it's, it's coming to... Um, he can see the light at the end of the tunnel and you're all going to be very happy about his, uh, his work. So uh, I, won't, I won't spill the beans as to what it's all about. I'll let uh, him and his big debut uh, let you all know. But what's really nice about um, Greg is he's, he's got so much experience. And that's what I learned from other ones like that, you know, people with that kind of experience. And he said to me, because I've overfilled tanks, so I'm not paying attention, and next thing you know, the water's gushing out. And he said, you can only do two things at the same time. I have done three, and I get very nervous, and usually it always results in one thing not working right, because you can't watch three things. But you can watch twi two things. Keeping your eye on one thing, watching the other. Keeping your eye on one thing, watching the other. So you can go back and forth like a ping pong table, and you can watch two things. Okay, this one's getting full. This one's going to hit first. Turn off the pump. Boom. You know, turn on the pump, turn off the pump. That's, that's this right here, see? So, turn on the pump, turn off the pump. And then, I can keep my eye on the other item that's also filling. But maybe the tank is filling itself. So, two things at once. And you can, you can do that quite um, hand... Well, of course, I only have the one tube and the one tank up here with the one hose with the one pump. So I'm only refilling one thing at a time. But if I'm, I'm also have uh, some, some of the big tanks have their own refill. So they might be on too. Hey, Aqua Malik, welcome. Glad to have you on board. Aqua Malik is in the house. Thank you. So now that I've demonstrated the routine for the water changes, I hope that answers the question. I think that was uh, Stub, um, uh, Stubbs' question, Stubbs Aquatics. And um, if I recall right, if I got that wrong, I apologize. It's, it's something that you have to handle with that many fish. Otherwise, you're going to just see lots of fish dying. The water cannot be allowed to go foul. The water cannot be allowed to build up on its nitrates. That leads to the next question. Our next question that this week from, from the resulting last week is this one. Uh, he, he makes mention of, this is Matthew Clayton. Now we're getting back to Matthew Clayton's uh, question. Thank you. Matthew Clayton, uh, Clayton says, I'm curious, Michael, why you choose a box filter over another type of filtration? Box filters never seem to be mentioned much. Well, he's right. I know they're not mentioned a whole lot. In fact, nowadays everybody is sponge, 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 sponge. Uh, I'm going to um, uh, explain why I have a sponge filter for the biological filtration, but I also use a box filter for the mechanical filtration. Now, you can't always use a box filter a box filter, just in case you're wondering, isn't necessarily a box. They used to be boxes. 
I'm going to show you the the case of this 30 gallon where my discus are. And for those of you who missed the discus, there they are. This is a box filter. This one's got quite a bit of algae on it. It's due for a change because what I'll do is just replace it with a, an entirely cleaned up box filter. And But on the other side of the tank, I have a humongous biological filter that's going strong. Now, this is going to serve the purpose of converting the nitrates from the nitrites. This one, as you can see, gets pretty dirty because it's taking, basically, it's grabbing the small particles in the water and clearing it up. Now what happens is, like in this case, I'm going to show you a tank that's getting cloudy. It's getting pretty murky. This one isn't so good. This one needs some help. That's why I'm going to move these fish to a bigger tank today. But if, as you can see also, it's got a box filter. It used to have only a, a, um, only a, a simple sponge filter. But the problem with that is that it wasn't taking the, the muck out of the water. It became very clear that they were producing a lot and, and it wasn't, um, you know, I try in the bottom, I always siphon out the bottom. If I can, like for even in this case, okay, you have these tanks here. Uh, the first thing I do is I just take a minute or two if I see that there's an issue. There isn't always an issue. Um, some, some tanks, they don't produce a lot of that uh, uh, stuff at the bottom. But I'm going to just give you an example. Maybe it's a, a transition. The, the, this tank here on my right, is actually got full of electric blues okay these are electric blues now they're in transition they only have a sponge filter but they're starting to eat the pellets and I'm trying to wean them off of the baby brine shrimp I would like them to eat the um, this is Dr. Basslier pellets but you can see they're not eating it as well as they should so it gets a pretty mucky. So I will actually siphon that bottom out. Okay. Now, let's look at tank number three. That was tank number four, by the way. Tank number three has lots of algae. But it's got a few pellets. Yeah, they're not eating it as great. They're at the stage two doing the same thing. I'm trying to get them to eat only pellets. Now, let's go to tank number two. Tank number two is spotless. Tank number two is spotless. Now, I don't see a need to siphon much out of the bottom just before I do a water change. If I needed to get rid of the, um, the muck that builds up, the detritus, I might, but in this case, there's no need for it. Let's take a look at tank number one just because we're here. The Odessa barbs that you saw in week one that were just born are now a wonderful four or five weeks old. These are just gorgeous. They're just gorgeous. Thank you, Aqua Malik. Yes, micro food in the water. So I wanted to point out one of the reasons why you don't see algae in this tank and why it's so clean and why you see algae in this tank. What's the difference when it's the same light? It's the same light above. The difference is that in the back. Can you see it? One baby bristle nose, and he is cleaning away. Look at that. A young bristle nose like that is just, that's why I keep the, uh, the generic bristle nose around. I like to have these babies so I can throw them into a tank like this, and it will be spotless. So, I hope that you enjoyed this, this, this segment here. We're talking about, if you've just joined us, we're talking about um, water changes and why and there's so many fish getting the needed water changes necessary in the cases of when fish are um, held or put in more high, highly concentrated tanks. It just means that the water has to change a lot more. So, for example, we were talking about this, this drip method. Okay. These are five gallon tanks. When I'm finished changing all four of these five gallons, that's 20 gallons. That's how many gallons is up at the top. 
So 20 gallons will go through in about two hours, maybe an hour and a half. So every day, these tanks are getting 100% water change slowly. Four times five gallons, 20 gallons. Tank up above holds actually 22 gallons. Actually, I think it, uh, it's a 25 gallon, but the bottom of the siphon is actually sucking up the water and, and um, so it can only grab about 22 gallons. So that's, that's a nice water change every day and it's gradual so they never feel a shock. They never, they never, never even notice. All they know is that the, the water seems to be great. Hey Zebra Pleco fans, welcome. Thanks to you. I appreciate very much. Th many thanks to you for your, your kind comments and your um, support on this channel. Now, going back to our question, I hope that answers the question about the box filter. The box filter also, by the way, has some biological... Um, I have ceramics in the bottom of the box filter, and when I clean them out, I don't clean the ceramics. I just change the floss leave the ceramics which has a, a lot of bacteria in it i pull the the floss out put new floss in the things now able to, to produce so <laughs> i don't like the algae on the box filter so i will actually take that that out and i will actually soak the uh, plastic box filter in bleach water because i want to kill all the algae because i just think it's unsightly but um i don't leave the ceramics in i actually move the ceramics from one box filter to my new box filter unwashed leave the ceramics put in a whole brand new set of uh, filter floss and away the box filter goes that's why i have box filters but i use them in conjunction with the um, um, sponge filters so we got biological filtration and some mechanical filtration also um uh the comment was Others have seen or used canister filters. I do have a canister filter or two running on the on the 90 gallon tank, but that's just because at the time I had very strong um, swimmers. I have the barbs. I'm not sure if I'm going to change that out now that I'm using the, the for grow out space for the rams. It's a little unclear on that. But be that as it may, if my room was full of mechanical plug-in filters, like over the back filters, um, my electricity bill would probably rise uh, because I would be adding, you know, so many watts per tank, and there's so it would be like, what, what, why do that when I can actually just do the same thing with air? And I've already got the air going. It's just one big pump, air pump, and it's one central system. So with one central system, well, why would I, why, why wouldn't I take advantage of that? Here is um, Green Thumb Aquariums, who also asks a question, very similar. He says, I like the water polishing potential of a box filter with filter floss. Have you ever tried a variation that included a power head rather than air? My aquariums are in a place where bubbling noises wouldn't be acceptable. Um, if, if that's your situation, I say, well, if that's the situation, you have to have use a power head or um, some electricity to push the water instead of using the air bubbles, fine. I, I sleep on the other side of that wall. You see this wall right here? That wall. That my bedroom, my bed is actually butted up against the back of that wall. So, so you know, I, I can hear the fish room, but it's just, you know, it's like in the distance. It's like just the nice sound of of a fish room gurgle 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 you know i you know i'm just i don't have a problem i sleep without an issue um i'm sure that there could be issues with others um depending on the person the circumstances so if no i have no problem with that it's just power usage so if you can say you know you, that's not an issue going on to um number question number one which was from hatchery man I don't want to skip his, com his comment from last week. He says, what brand and type of food do you use for the Blue Ram Grow Out? So um, again, the Grow Outs, once they're off the baby brine shrimp, they're going to get to about this size. 
once they're past this size, I've got these going on onto the, the pellets. It's going to be, I'll show you. I'm looking for two different kinds of foods, and I'll tell you why. We might find this interesting. I use two different kinds of foods, and uh, they're both small granules. I use this AAA premium high intensity color, half millimeter, and I get them on this. It's like this is not as good, in my opinion, as this one, Dr. Baslier Bio Fish Food. And one of the reasons. Um, this one also is 0.5, yeah, this is also 0.5 to 0.8 millimeter, and it's um, also uh, great quality food. Let me just check, just to compare the difference in these two kinds. I, I see protein here, let's see, I got to, oh, I have to find the ingredient, 56%, 56% food protein, um, this one is 48%. 48%. This one clouds the water a little bit more. The, the other one doesn't cloud the water at all. This is great stuff. Just like Malik always says, that's that's the one to go with. So um, I agree. It's just a matter of one is just a little bit more money. But why do I have two? I'm going to tell you why I have two. I use two different kinds because I feel that if you feed a solo food only one kind of food constantly one food and that's it you will you will actually I'm not saying there will be a deficiency but I'm saying that it's more likely the fish themselves will become more accustomed to a variation in fact what I should remember to do is before I sell them I should be you know actually give them a little flake food too and because because when they get to the market and they go into people's tanks what are they going to feed them Dr. Basilier. The fish sometimes develop a preference since what they're raised on is the only food that they, they eat. And I don't like that. I like them keep doping them up with some variety. So then I also, if, when they get a little bigger, bigger, I also have some uh, omega-1 granules that I might sprinkle from time to time to give them something else to chew on. And it's just to give them the variety they need. So... Even my discus, um, I have um, the Dr. Basilier. I have the smaller, the larger. I have some in this container. It's a little bit larger. I mean, I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, you can see it's a little larger. Not, I don't know which millimeter size that is, but uh, I got a little sample of that. I'm using my, my discus will eat that. And then I also give them the um, what they're accustomed to. This is from the breeder. This is what the breeder of these discus uh, was using. So they're accustomed to this, and so I didn't want to change it up. And they like that. It's a, um, this is a, the tetra color granule. So by, by having one or two different kinds, they're, they're not going to get stuck on one specific type, and, that, and just that be it. So that's the important thing. So now let's, uh, let's think about the concluding today's episode with a few things um, I'm sorry I didn't get to my pH meter that's something I still want to get to a box opening I, it's still in the box I, I just haven't had a moment to take care of that it's kind of um, sad about that but um, um, and it's also I just wanted to cover a few things like you know mentioning at the end of the year so you know a good if you look at how much the rams have contributed to the fish room, um, it's very interesting that they have covered um, all the all the income for this fish room has been handled by these fish. I don't have an issue of of my hobby costing me more. My hobby is really breeding fish, so <laughs> that's what I enjoy doing. It's 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 not just viewing fish. Uh, I guess I, I would I would love to have a tank, and I've always had one that I just like to view. And I call it my display tank, you know, it's something to display and something to look at. Put some favorite fish in there. I, I had those um, Roseline Sharks because they're beautiful to look at. I love the Dakinzia genus and I, uh, they, were, they were wonderful. 
I sold them all in one weekend um, on Kijiji. I just needed to make immediate room for these uh, rams, so I decided to do that. And, um, and it went quick, but they're so beautiful and so fun to watch. I used to have a display tank in my bedroom, and it had uh, filament barbs, very similar, but you know, quite dramatically different in their own way. And I enjoyed those with tinfoil barbs. And it was a hundred and it was a hundred and twenty gallon tank, and uh, that was just a that was fun, you know. And, it, and at night, these fish are just like they're just flowing, and it's so soothing. And I, I would sit there on the, the little sofa we had in the bedroom and just stare at them and watch them. But uh, in this fish room, you know, the, the rams have, have, are actually 45% of my, my gross amount that came into this particular tank, fish room came from the rams. So I'm really happy with them. And the final question on here was about black rams. Uh, somebody asked me this question. Can you believe it? Somebody asked me this question. Um, this question is from Spencer Smith. Just a suggestion, but black rams or black night rams seem to be very popular right now. Do some, do some videos on them. It should bring in extra views. Thank you. That's a great suggestion. I appreciate it. Are you selling black rams? <laughs> Finding, sourcing black rams is the biggest issue. There's such a shortage of them. There's not many out there. And the people who have them, I'm not sure, um, and I don't think they breed true, and that's another issue. You could breed uh, 100 of them, and I don't think you're going to get uh, 100 black rams. You're going to get some that are not, not as black, not as desirable, so there's going to be, it's quite different. In this room, the German blues all come out the same. My, my electric blues are all coming out the same. And maybe next week I'll show you the oldest electric blues that I have. They're really looking sharp, even at a small, small size. But if somebody can find a source for black rams, let me know. Drop it in the comments. Let me know if someone's available. Because it would be really nice in this fish room to compare black rams with the blue rams with the electric blues and to be able to see and learn. Now, I think that the electric blues have taught me a lot about highly inbred rams. And uh, on smallest fish room, welcome. Yep, you have some growing out right now. Please, in the comments, please let us know. I would love to know um, when you raise them up, what's the percentage that are actually totally dark, so totally black, you know? And is that males and females, or just the males? Um, or is it all of them? Uh, I, I don't think it's all of them, but that's just my, my understanding of the genetics behind them. And Aqua Malik, you made a good point. Maybe the, the rams from Israel, maybe they're more fixed in their line. And um, I'd like to see. Yes, and so finally, um, on today's agenda, if there's something to see, um, I think, let me just check uh, my list right here real quick. I have actually um, two things. I have two things uh, just to, to let you take a peek at. And what we're going to peek at is the Lucipinus, because I don't think we did that last week. And uh, these are the young ones that we saw. And uh, I'm going to just take a look. I'm going to take the lid off. Now, here is the breeder box. See, in the back, you can see the, there's, there's one of the, the parents. There they are. Let's take a look at these guys in the breeder box. How are they doing? As you can see here, these are starting to get color. These are doing awesome. And uh, I, I should have thrown a little... Yeah. Here we go. They're really looking good. And then the next, the next two 
boxes. Um, you see they're a little smaller, but they're growing. They're growing tremendously. I'm going to actually do you a favor. I'm going to remove... Oops, sorry, there's the lid. I'm going to remove... kind of move that leaf around just to give you an idea what it looks like. Whoa! There we go. Good batch. These little catfish are just amazing. Yeah, and then so we're getting close to the full moon. That means I am watching the uh, tank, the egg, the egg uh, trap for more. Here's uh, number three. These are a few days younger or older. See, I mean, these are actually four days older than the one we just looked at. But uh, there's quite a few in there. These these two groups. This is another example of they're only four days apart collected four days apart so this group and this group will eventually be merged together into one tank okay and of course let's take a look at the oldest ones I have raised they're up here and they're looking spiffy look at that pardon my California talk they're just they're looking like loose of business these are these are really out these are just amazing fish really these particular ones are outstanding because they they're very hardy it's very hard to lose them very hard to lose them um after they get up to a certain age about this age you know they're hardy they don't they don't not drop enough i haven't lost a one since they got past the the eating of the baby brine shim and lastly Thank you very much, uh, Corridor Zone Aquatics, for joining us. Glad you like the Lucipinas. I do too. They're amazing. And uh, I wanted to look at one tank up here that we've started a, a group of German Blues. All I have here is three pair, four pair I threw in here. And they're at the age where they're starting to like decide among themselves and take a mate and see if I can get a better focus but these these fish are actually going to be in here and I'm going to pick out the the two pair that form or bond they're all great fish so they're all number one none of them are uh, have any uh, faults that I would find or see if I did I would pull them but I'm going to end up with two pair for this tank and I'll end up putting probably some divider, bigger sponge filter in the middle or something to separate them and I'll probably end up with a pair in the back and the pair in the front. But because they're setting up their distinct territories in their limited amount of space, they're going to be fine with that. If I had just one pair in here and I introduced another pair, um, that second pair added would be shredded in no time gone but these guys they're, they're these girls look at those girls that's just, just tremendous two females here kind of looking at each other yeah these are nice so we're going to see what we can do with that that was the second thing so i hope you enjoyed the i hope you enjoyed the live stream today uh let's see if there's any final comments there i think there was one uh response we got back yes from smallest fish room so far they do not breed true. They are black and gold and they are just about a month old. Well, that's that's why breeding these fish, you, you're not gonna get you're not gonna be able to take the same amount of pairs I have here and produce a thousand black rams. You will not. However, you will be able to produce some. So that's why in my opinion I'd like to get some black rams. I don't know where you're at, smallest fish room. <laughs> If you're in Canada, you know, I'll I'll make the make the trip to get some, and whatever it is. But um, I think the point that we want to do is is get our hands on some in here, and, and then ourselves kind of work up and uh, build up a little small quantity of these uh, quality ones. I'm interested in only top quality, and if I can get some top quality ones to go in here, and then we can work with them. I, I'm not. I'm not afraid of getting, you know, some gold rams outputted along the way. That's okay. 
if you understand how recessive genes work, you'll understand that in many cases, when you put two recessive uh, um, animals together, you're going to get recessive traits that will shine forth or shine out. But if you take one that has a recessive trait and a dominant trait, the dominance will always show on the outside. But when you cross them with one that's recessive, recessive, you'll get a percentage. Um, in that case, you'll get about 50% um, uh, in dominant and 50% recessive. Now, I know this because for many years I raised and trained pigeons. And uh, I am, uh, if you do some Googling around, you'll even find that I'm actually um, uh, a flyer of uh, tippler pigeons. And back in the 1992, I broke the record for the United States flying uh, tippler pigeons for 18 hours and five minutes. And that record still holds today. So m knowing in the world of pigeons or genetics, it could be any animal really, and what is a recessive trait and why you can take a a, what we called, uh, for example, we had blacks and we had duns. A black was the dominant color and the dun was the black with recessive, it was a dilution gene that occurred on the black and it caused the bird to look like it was uh, sort of a chocolate brown. So you had, a, you had a black and you had a dun. Now, if you put two duns together, you're going to end up getting duns. You put a black and a dun together, you're going to get blacks. You put a black and a black, blacks. But you, you, in order to get the duns out, the recessive gene, you had to put the two, the two um, recessive ones. Or the, one of the parents had to be split. for the, In other words, they had to have the recessive gene, even though it was black. It could be black carrying the recessive gene, you see. So it may be black, but oh, its mother was was a dun. So it carried the recessive gene, but it would only produce recessive if it was with another recessive, because, and that that's the way it works. Anyway, you can do your little pundit squares and and uh, figure out the, the the colors and everything, but uh, that's something that just kind of goes along north of Toronto. How far north? Well. If you've got some quality fish, you know, I wouldn't mind going for a trip. <laughs> so keep those fish going and keep them, keep them uh, growing up. If you get so many high quality ones, I'll take the best ones out of the lot. Of course, uh, you can name your price. You know, you get what you uh, pay for. And I, I'm, I, I think Malik is, haha, <laughs> Malik, I said first, I got div. No, of course, you could come along with me. But the point is, Malik and I have talked about this on numerous occasions. And the number one thing is, when you're going to start a breeding project, you have to start with the top quality. You don't start with the inferior quality thinking that you're going to make higher quality. So I go to the store, I see the black rams, I look at them, and I say, that black ram looks like a blue ram that's got smudge on it. That's not a black ram. That's not the black rams that, that have already proven to be out there. So we know that this is the case, that the, the quality is the important thing when you're starting a breeding project. And it's the quality. Because then when you get the top quality, you will get inferior quality out by a certain percentage. Like for example, um, I don't know if anybody's ever said this, but I do know that if you took two gold rams from small fish room, his, his batch, those gold rams would carry the genes for the black. But I could breed them together and breed them together and breed them together, gold to gold to gold to gold, and I would never see a black. Yeah, the gene is there. But in order to get it out, I might need to put it with another one that is more dominant black, and then it might get. If I got one out, it would be very unlikely, but it's not impossible. So just remember, um, it's not mathematically sound. You know, anything can happen in genetics. Just to prove a point, um, most pigeons come out blue or they come out red. Once in a while, you will get something, uh, I forget the name of it, um, 
there's a special name in genetics when this happens. It's when the genes get a little mixed up. And you, I have seen f birds, a pigeon, with one side blue and on the other side black of the same pigeon. And once in a while, I've seen this in fish. Um, I've seen, for example, I think it was Jonathan Walker. Or one of you guys was telling me about a, a fish that was kind of black only half of the body and uh, correct me if I'm wrong who that was but anyway yeah so you're gonna you're gonna end up um, um, getting these ab abnormalities every once in a while and so that's going to happen but if you're looking to breed something and you're looking for um, some nice quality I go to the store I, I looked at the store um, yesterday it was yes no it was uh, Thursday I was there I swung by, I had to um, handle some business on those the ram sale, and I, and I walked in the store and I saw the gold rams and I looked at them and they were pathetic. They were the only ones he had. I, I, I just want to read them, you know, I just want to get them, you know, I just, you know, the idea of, of just jumping in there and getting those rams and saying to yourself, well, they'll look nice in my tanks and I can do something better. Perhaps. Perhaps you can get some nice fish out of them if you treat them right and they look better than they did when they were in the fish store. But what I say is pass on them. Pass on them. Wait until the next order comes in because there was only a few left. They were the last of the last of the picked over. They, they were the bottom of the, the choices. Go to the store when they get them in and when you see a tank that has lots to pick from that means they just got them in that means there's lots to pick from and you will pick out the best when I got these electric blues it was a tank full of fish and I picked out the six three pair of the best ones that they had and uh, they let me pick them out too because I, I don't think um, they're they're harder to sex I was I was um, exact in my in my estimations and I ended up with exactly three pair because I knew uh, what I was looking for and I could look at the fish just the body shape and I knew it was a male or female but there was no black spot to determine whether it was a male or female there was no longer rays on the dorsal fan for the males because they they tend to look a little short fin on the top side that's how most all the electric blues I've ever seen uh, look well Getting those best of the whole lot tells me that that's where a good starting point is. And we'll see. If one day I came across a better batch of fish, I'm at a store, and you have these fish, and you've invested um, six months on these fish, suddenly you see at the store there are fish there that are ten times better than the ones you have at home. What do you do? What would you do? Where's your comment? Give me a comment. I want to hear. What would you do? You've invested six months in the fish that you have in your... Oh. <laughs> Malik. You know, Malik, you and I are just like two peas in a pod. Obviously, you buy the good quality. And you can come home and you say, well, I'm going to mix these with mine. Why would you take something that's top quality, take something that's mediocre quality, I'm not saying it's bad quality because you picked them to begin with, you've been working with them, and, and don't take the me mediocre ones. Me mediocrity and the best quality coming together does not make the best quality coming out. You see, it's going to actually drop or bring down. So in, in, in that particular breeding project, I would say, yeah, I would buy them, bring them home, and pretty much sell off everything that you've done for the last six months. I would get rid of everything. If they were mediocre in comparison to what you got. Not saying that they were bad to begin with. I'm just saying they were the best at the time that you had. But now you've come across something that's a little nicer. That's your starting point. And that's where I would go. And you can work to improve by always looking at the progeny and taking out the best of the best 
before you sell them off, the 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 the, uh, the ones that you're selling. Yep, thank you, Corridors Zone Aquatics. You are right. I agree with you 100%. Buy the new ones. Don't waste time on inferior material. Maybe it was all you had at the time. But if I go to the store, and I know there's some uh, black rams out there that are that are just um, kind of dark. They're not really black. Okay. Maybe somebody wants to breed gray rams. Maybe. I don't know if there's a market for gray rams. Or I'm going to give you a gene that is used in the pigeon world that I kind of classify as what I see. It's called the smoky gene. The smoky gene actually is a layer uh, on the blue pigeon. It actually makes it look dirty. And so it, it, it has it has like this, this, this superficial kind of like dirt color spread across the feathers. Well, same thing in fish. I've seen it too. Smoky gene is going to just give it a smoky feel, kind of like, you know, kind of dark, but you still see the underlying fish. It's a gene on top of a gene. So in other words, what you're seeing is the, the, the um, display of the outer gene, the smoky gene, on top of the gene underneath. So anyway, I've gone off track a little bit, but uh, just to give you some ideas of some things to think about, um, if you want to breed smoky rams, fine. Call it a smoky gene. What, I'm not looking for smoky genes. I would like to. I would like to work with black rams, ones that are as black as possible. And to give you a simple, simple analogy, just look at the angelfish. Yes, there's many angelfish that are called silver, gorgeous fish, the natural silver coloration. It, it's it's astounding, beautiful silver body, dark stripes. Then look at the black angelfish. Which ones look the nicest? The ones that look kind of like smoky in between? Or the ones that look black? The ones that look black look like a shadow, look like they're not angels. They're, they're sort of like the opposite, you know? They're like black devils, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, the shape and the, the look and the, and especially if they have red eyes oh man that's uh that's quite a lick and so of course they're still just fish but <laughs> but we can really you know imagine and think about what what that really kind of comes across and and why they're so popular black angel fish are very popular of course with any inbred fish and any where the gene has been you know locked in by inbreeding line breeding um, all this is uh, um, makes for sometimes a, a neglect on other characteristics and thus uh, sometimes they become more aggressive as a characteristic that may have been overlooked or been allowed to, to continue. If you have some beautiful fish coming along but they have other faults, don't ignore those faults. Um, in your breeding when you come and you get some beautiful fish, oh, they're very awesome, but they've got some other faults. Just remember, that fault will be carried in. If you decide to use that in your breeding program, that particular fish, remember, it carries its faults with it. So sometimes faults can be hard to get out. And later down the road, when they become just as fixed as the other coloration or finage that you're actually breeding for. Well, I've been talking over an hour. Our time is up, and I appreciate everybody being here. Just to make sure if there's anything more, um, Christopher Emerson, thank you very much for joining us. Yes, um, they're not completely dark, but nor are normal rams. Both parents were black. If you pair them together, what do you get? Very good question. You'll get normals. Yeah, you get the mediocre. You, you'll never get more darker than the, the well... It would be very hard, you'd be very hard pressed to get anything darker because you're putting two, two together. Now, in sometimes in line breeding, um, just so you know, to bring some strength into the line, what they've done is uh, many times you take a parent, you take the parents, and then they produce these that are perhaps 
not so great, but they're very strong in other attributes. They have characteristics that are also very strong. For example, if most of the progeny are coming out, let's say with split, split fins. I'm just making this up, but let's say they come with a tail that comes with a split fin, and you can see it's a genetic fault. Take the ones that do not have the genetic fault and use that, but you can breed those back to the ones that are the darker ones, and you can breed um, uh, line breeding that way, and it will um, strengthen the uh, dark line as opposed to um, allowing a new fault to occur. Now, what I'm talking about is is the answer to your, your question. What happens if you take two mediocres? Uh, oh, and, and I'm just using the term. I think Roman has a good point here. Roman says mediocre is in the eye of the beholder. Yes. Yes, it is. I... I want to I want to mention something. I have proof here too, and uh, this is something that's been going on. And uh, whoa, sorry about that. My, almost lost it there. Okay, I want to just show you some interesting fish. I've never showed you these fish before. Do you see these goldfish? I have three of them left. I've I've lost the other ones. Do you see them? Do you see them in the back there? There's one in the back. Can you see that fish? Anybody know what it is? How about that one? There's two of them in there, see? Whoa. Can you make it out? Not enough light, not enough focal. Anybody know what that is? Torpedo barb. The first answer it comes back from Christof, Christo, Christopher Amerson. You are correct. They are torpedo barbs. Also known as Denison barbs. Also known as Dakinzia denisoni. Also known as Roseline sharks. Now, oh, don't worry about the Latin name. It, it's changed several times. And the most recent one is Dakinzia Denisonan. The, the fact is, those fish you just looked at are gorgeous fish. But almost every one of them has eye issues. I picked up um, uh, about 10 of them when they came in. And I was like in shock because I never thought I would even see one of those in real life. And they, they showed up at the fish store. And they just come in and I says, oh, I'll take them. Because I knew that if I had left, come back a week later, they'd be gone. Unfortunately, they're going blind. There is blindness associated with a gold torpedo barb that is well documented. In fact, any of you, I get uh, Dan's fish room uh, from Wyoming. Dan from. He, he sends out a newsletter, and in one of the recent newsletter, I think it was in December, um, there's a whole article with pictures explaining these fish. And he had a bunch for sale, and he sold a lot of them. But he admits and explained in his live broadcast about the, the, the blindness issues and the other issues that occur with these fish. I had some that were so blind, they just got torn apart by the other fish because they didn't see them coming, and so they just picked at them. I had some that, um, yeah, so what I bought was basically a, a total loss, which was okay. I just wanted to get them. I didn't realize there was education involved, and that always happens. You get a new fish, and you're not really thoroughly knowledgeable about that fish. You're going to end up with fish that you're sorry you bought in the beginning or an end, but th this is what was explained to me. In the reading of that information from Dan's, there, he, there's a link to a web page. That's going to be one of the links. I'm going to put that link down below in this live cast uh, for you to, to click on um, after I upload. Okay, so it will be there. And this link is a wonderful explanation. But what's happening in the place where they're mass producing these is that they're so expensive and they're sending out these fish and they're so valuable each one that they will not call properly they're not calling for the blindness they're just getting these fish moved on 
and so what we're getting is a lot of garbage and um, so unfortunately when you're breeding uh, fish with a characteristic such as that and this occurs like for example with many albinos or albinos or some of some of you say um, a lot of albinos will have this issue red eyes but also and a tendency towards blindness but these are particularly bad when it comes to their their um, their hardiness um, their being um, uh, able to see and, and properly find the food and I can throw the food in there and I know and I know they just kind of going around and they, they find the food that's how they're growing but it's not easy for them now I put them in that large tank with the rams because um, I felt sorry for them they need to grow they might grow they might not end up becoming anything but I did know one thing is for sure they don't bother the rams one of the reasons is they're a peaceful fish to begin with and in groups and they, they do very they do very well however um, that the bottom line is these are kind of on the blind side so they don't attack the rams they 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 don't even see them they actually kind of bump into them so you know with a big enough tank i thought well give them some space and they'll be okay and there's nothing in there that will bother them the rams won't won't even give them heed it won't bother them whatsoever yes christopher i agree with you very sad very sad uh, predicament and so i would never buy those fish again i would never get some that's why i never showed them to you before in the past live streams um it's not something I want to promote, you know. It's something that is really kind of sad, and I wish that one day, uh, if they did have some that were fully healthy but had that coloration, well, marvelous, you know. Goldfish come in amazing colors. So do betta fish. They all come in amazing colors, and and yet they were able to do that without bringing in these kinds of bad traits, and uh, because they were responsible genetic breeders and um, unfortunately it does happen in the dog world too many many types of species uh, come in I remember when when I was young we had a pug and then the pug had uh, babies puppies and we were just kids and uh, it was a sad thing when uh, about one-third of the puppies always had cleft palate and my dad had to go drown the, the puppies it was really sad to, to cull the puppies, you know, because they were they were coming out with cleft palates. Uh, it was it, it would need to require a surgery, but basically they just starved to death because they 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 suck for the milk and then the little puppies can't. I mean they're tiny, but they they're not getting nourishment. They're not getting food, and they they will end up dying anyway. So, but then the ones that don't have the cleft palate, they they go on, but. We continue to breed them, and you see uh, these breeds of, of dogs, and uh, they're, they're, anyway, that's that's the subject of another day. And uh, thank you very much, everyone. It's been long and long and longer than I expected or hoped for, but I hope everybody had a good time just uh, talking fish, enjoying their Saturday afternoon, um, looking at a fish room and going through some of the steps. Today we learned a lot about um, management and we still haven't really gotten to the bottom of of all water management because I will take you through one day all of the um, uh, complete water management that goes in through this room and uh, that will be something uh, interesting that you know how easy it is and we'll talk about um, how to set up a drain system how to set up a um, the, the water system and, and and what you need to know just the details of what you need to know to do all that so thank you for your comments if if you've liked what you saw hit a thumbs up if you don't like what you saw you can hit the thumbs down it doesn't matter to me um i'm not i'm not uh, offended one way or the other but when you interact i appreciate it very much i love the interaction because it's a way for me to know that somebody is actually benefiting something from my experience and i'm sharing my experience because i want to and uh, I care about my fish. I love my fish, and I know other people out there too. So join your local club because if you join a club, if you're joining and being active and participating and, 
and doing things it also builds on your appreciation for your tanks and your fish at home and your breeding projects and um, I recommend that to anybody right now it's kind of COVID time and so clubs are kind of doing things by zoom our local club the uh, Peel region um, aquarium club PRAC uh, it has a website uh, Peel aquariumclub.org um, I'll put that link also in the in down below but we have meetings and this month in January it will be online only it will be on zoom so you'll get to sit at home and enjoy on a on the Wednesday at the third Wednesday of the month you get to enjoy a, a program a speaker and uh, some interaction with other fish lovers of all kinds so your local area wherever you may be even if you're in Australia in the replay or if you're in Europe uh, Sunday morning watch catching the replay whatever please um, support your local club and um, support uh, one another because that's that's where we really learn a lot and where we gain a lot of um, knowledge thank you everyone thank you so much and appreciate all of you and we'll be we'll be back uh, surely next week if I ever need to cancel a live stream I will post a, uh, uh, a message in the uh, community area so you'll get you'll see a post that will say it's been canceled or detained or postponed or whatever and I'll let everybody know uh, via that method but uh, thank you very much for checking in on this is um, the 411 information uh, fish room information for all of you who enjoy your fish in in, in, in the fish rooms so Take care and have a great weekend.